Hello. Yes, this is Crystal Heart Cosby with the second episode of um, Abdul Sattar Idi's book, A Mirror, A Mirror to the Blind, written by, or transcribed by Tamina Durani. I uh, spoke to you about the first part. I read out the first part to you yesterday, and today people want the second part. Right. Uh, now, uh, chapter two. My parents descended from a community of small farmers involved in petty fights with different tribes living on the river banks. Three centuries ago, a religious leader in Tatta converted them from the Hindu faith to Islam and named them Momins, meaning true believers. This was later distorted to Maimons. In respect for the example set by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, exemplary business partnerships with Hazrat Bibi Khadija, the old age sage advised them to adopt trading and business as their vocation. He also instructed them to maintain a strong sense of community. The Maimans moved from Hala in Sindh through the Thar Desert or via the Ran of Kutch and migrated to Gathiawar in Gujarat, India. Wherever they settled became their future identity. The Bairavel Maimans, the Doraji and Kotiana Maimans and us the Bantra Mavens. <coughs> we descended from the Edi family. Once there was a village named Edi Mohalla, but that disappeared over time. Although Edi in the Gujarati language means lazy, the tribe was vigilant, committed to hard work, and born with the spirit for humanitarianism. They were middle class people who avoided involvement in intrigues and disputes. My grandfather, Haji Rematullah, did not believe in making surplus money. In fact, it was said he disliked anything surplus with a vengeance and rejected it in thought, food, comforts and desires. Keeping his lifestyle down to basics, he conducted duties similar to those of the Chamber of Commerce in Bombay. When a member of the, of the community went bankrupt or when two parties were embroiled in some conflict, he would intervene and mediate. His son, my father, Abdul Shikur Edi, inherited the same temperament and continued with the same profession as a commission agent in Bombay. When the Habib Bank was established at the behest of Muhammad Ali Jannah by two well-known maimans, Habib Rahmatullah and Haji Dawood Parikh, my father was approached and out of friendship rather than political views offered his support for the opening of accounts. Large maiman business houses like Tada Limited, Iraq Limited and Adam Limited elevated members of our community to trusted managerial posts, accountants or commission agents. <coughs> Lower grades were filled by locals. They trained young maiman boys in their organization for two to three years so that they developed business acumen. Often they advanced financial aid for them to pursue and establish private businesses. My father was twice widowed before he married my mother, who was called Horba. His first wife had borne him a son. Horba Gharib means in, in Urdu means uh, poor. His first wife had borne him a son, the second a son and a daughter. In those times, there was a grave shortage of eligible Maimon girls, as they were so sought after. Much money and gold were required for their hand. And to avoid this, men began to bring back wives from Bengal, Karnatak, and Malabar. At the time of my parents' marriage, my father offered my mother 50 grams of gold as dowry. My mother belonged to the Diwan family, which was a respected business house. She had been divorced after a traumatic and violent marriage, this is important, <coughs> that gave her a son and a daughter. It was not considered a slur or a dis disadvantage to be a divorced, to be divorced or widowed. In fact, it was in adherence to the principles of Islam to marry a woman of that category. Now, I, this is my point. I'm not reading the book now. Uh, this is exactly where I think we Muslims have regressed. Uh, these were practices of those days, and today widows and uh, divorced women are looked down upon. When my mother married again, her sister raised her two children, while she had to raise those of my father. So again, you know, now I'm speaking, not reading from the book. This, I think, is an important turn of events in Abdul Sattar Edi's life. In the first chapter, I spoke of Bilal, his grandson, and how his death 
had a profound impact on this man. And here we speak of his mother, who was a widowed woman who had children from her first marriage, and those children were raised by her sister because she was somehow expected to raise her new husband's children and the new husband was somehow perhaps not prepared to have her first husband's children. Bantwa, a small village near Junagadh in Gujarat, was well planned with wide streets and open spaces. Out of the 25,000 inhabitants, 70% were Maimans. <coughs> As there was a strong sense of simplicity in Bantwa, big bungalows belonged to prosperous businessmen belonging to prosperous businessmen were occupied by large families following the popular tradition of a joint family system. Even here, an entire family was accommodated in a single room. The smaller dwellings were placed close together on both sides of narrow alleys, while some were clustered on ridges in tiers at different levels. Shopkeepers lived in the marketplace, either above their shops or behind them. There were two high schools, a library, and five free dispensaries. We lived in an area called Dob Thobi Bara, named after washermen who were its original inhabitants. My father owned the building we lived in, and my paternal grandmother died uh, here. I can recall my father gently lifting a lizard with his handkerchief from the white sheet that covered her. Young as I was, I was taken aback by the absence of disgust in his expression. Around the same time, my 13-year-old half-sister contracted a fever and my father took her for specialized treatment to Ahmedabad and Junagar. They returned without hope and she died shortly after. By the time I was seven years of age, we sold the building and shifted from Dobi Bara. My father tied a thick rope around his heavy iron safe containing gold and cash and lowered it down the staircase from the third floor. It had slipped and hurt his hands. Other than that, we possessed only a cupboard, a wooden swing, some bedding, and, few, and a few utensils. We moved to another mohalla, besides which were constructed eight little quarters. The room that housed my family had a small veranda covered with, with steel mesh, and we shared an open-air bathroom with two other families, an open-air bathroom. My stepbrothers had left for work in Bombay, so there was just me, there was just my sister Zubeda and baby brother Aziz at home. <coughs> we would sleep on thin cotton mattresses and lined up on the floor in the morning. And in the morning, our mother would make me climb up, up upon the cupboard to break down her pots and pans. She would, kick, she would cook us a staple diet of tea and lentils to eat with bread. At night, she would clean and polish the utensils, and I would climb up again to replace them. Soon I discovered one that she never used and began saving money in it, because I was the only one available for this job. Nobody ever detected my secret. I virtually grew up playing pranks and games in the streets and alleys of Pantua, with little interest in formal, with little interest in formal education, as I was never attentive in the small madrasa I attended. The schoolmaster, in an attempt to minimize my mischief, immediately appointed me the class monitor at the start of each term. The boys I played with were all under my influence. I was the leader. I divided them into teams and delegated some form of mischief to each. Sometimes we would heap stones, move back a good distance and charge at full speed, shouting and kicking with all our might to bring the pile down. At other times, we waited like predators for bullock guards carrying fruit to the market. When we spotted one, we ran from far behind, jumped high and swept watermelons and other seasonal fruits to feast upon. Sometimes we climbed trees and made loud animal noises to scare people. We would race in the fields or play hopscotch in the dirt baths for the better part of the day. So this is the childhood of Abdul Sadar Iri. Again, this is me speaking. This is not reading from the book. This is not me reading from the book. This is me reading from me. And this is me speaking from me. So um, I think he had he had a lovely childhood, he had a beautiful childhood, and he was very playful, uh, as in contrast to the seriousness that we saw later in his life. My mother was very gentle, sensitive, and quiet. Although there were a few occasions where there were where there was argument between my parents, she remained somewhat sad.
Her condition was related to the two children she left with her sister. The suppression of her maternal longing made her melancholic. My father would often shake his head and advise me, never marry another man's wife. She carries too many burdens. Now again, not reading from the book, speaking from me, uh, I have recently launched a political party of women in Pakistan called AurathKiawaz.com A-U-R-A-T-A-W-A-Z A-U-R-A-T-K-I-A-W-A-Z dot com AurathKiawaz dot com Voice of Women And I talk about these things, these small or big social injustices that here was a woman of the Sattar's Edi's mother who couldn't keep her children and I think all this had a profound impact on Edi's latter life. I think he internalized his mother's pain in a way like I internalized my mother's pain. Maven men spent 10 months of the year selling wares in Bombay, Rangoon, Hyderabad, Colombo and Calcutta, because of which my father's job kept him away from home. He would dispatch a big sack containing samples of cashew nuts, pistachio and ginger every few months for us. But my mother was averse to keeping everything she received for herself. She divided the fruit equally into packets that she and I would make together and sent me off to distribute them amongst the more needy. Here's another part of his childhood which, which, which shows us how he turned into a philanthropist, into a social reformer and social worker. This was a habit that he instilled in me very early in my life. Excuse me, I have a sinus issue and I have post nasal trip, so I keep coughing and I keep yawning. A uh, viewer, uh, uh, she complained about my yawns, but it's a problem that I have. I have high dysthonia and I would yawn, so you have to bear with the yawns. Yawn. <laughs> this was a habit that she, instilled, that she instilled in me very early in my life. Each, each morning she gave me two pesos for school and advised me to give one to somebody poor and spend one on myself. Always find out, always find out if the person is really in need. It is poisonous to give charity to useless people and to embarrass those who do not need it. Uh, when I returned home from school and as soon as I stepped through her door, she would inquire, what did you do with the money? As there was a strong disapproval of lies in our home, uh, she could always detect the answer from my expression and her taunts would always would, would begin. You have a selfish heart, one that has nothing to give. I would eat uh, I would eat faster at such times, wash the plates faster, and increase the speed of my movements to avoid the tirade. She would talk just as fast. What kind of a human being are you? Look at the greed in your eyes. She would not pause. I tried not to hear. Already you have started robbing the poor. How much more will you rob from them in your lifetime? The disgust on her face and the sharpness of her tone always made me blush with shame. And I think if these were the parents of Asif Ali Zadari, our ex-president, or Mia Muhammad Nawaz Sharif, or Mia Shabash Sharif, or whatever those people are, or you know the other leaders, the Jabhat Islami, or the Altaf Sands, or whatever, what would they tell them? I think they would have killed them. <laughs> they should have. I mean, if not killed them, at least... You know, I don't know, because it, it's really beyond me that here is one guy who was reprimanded for just perhaps misspending one pesa, and here are people who spend billions of dollars, trillions of public money on themselves. Again, this is me speaking, this is not the book. Um, only when I performed some good deed as compensation would the taunt stop. Her remarks and insults were tortuous and train me to deprive myself rather than pay the heavy toll she extracted for what she termed seeds of greed that grow into an oak tree. She was definitely creative in insults. Anyway, due to the sharing of money, searching for human interest stories became a pastime that sharpened my instincts. Somebody's calling me. I don't want to talk to him, so I'll just end the call. Yes. And I'll also reduce the volume of my cell phone so it wouldn't disturb our recording and that somehow seems to be a challenge. Anyway, challenge met. So, due to the sharing of money, searching for human interest stories became a pastime that sharpened my instincts and enabled me to differentiate between the needy and the lazy. 
Although Bantwa was prosperous, many poor pastis or uh, dwellings surrounded it. I would inquire about the conditions and problems of poor settlers, relate them to my mother, who would send me back with edibles and medicines. As most husbands were away, my mother also occupied herself with the affairs of older women. I'm sure they didn't have uh, sex in the city and desperate housewives in those days. Uh, she would organize and help with childbirths and encourage women to work from home so that they became self-reliant. Although we received 50 or 60 rupees every month from my father and never faced poverty, she would send me to the shop to bring back bundles of cotton to clean. I would carry a sack full on my back through the bazaars shouting, make way, make way. This would keep the dry husk for burning the stove. We would keep the dry husk for burning the stove and return the wool to the shop for a stipend. She was a strong believer in the dignity of labor. Another thing that we learned about in his childhood. In the holy month of Ramadan, which we have right now, uh, she collected other Bayman ladies and made bundles of food stuff, which she sent me to drop <coughs> through the windows of poor people or needy relatives. All the while, her soft whispery voice echoed behind me. It is charity only when your left hand does not know what the right has given. When the respect of the receiver is foremost. Again, something that we see embellished in him as through his later life. I would flash past pens in an attempt to make deliveries in record time. Again on Eid, she would put money in brown envelopes and instruct me to follow the same procedure saying, the burden of need and the shame of charity increases with knowledge of the hand that extends it. Then relief transforms into embarrassment. Beautiful, isn't it? I would knock on windows, drop the packets in, and ran and ran and run away before anyone could spot me. This fellow ran away. A rich businessman had opened a dispensary near our home. Old ladies living there, the main bazaar would spot me every time I passed by and shout, Oh, Sataria! That was his nickname, Satari. The Satari being Sataria. Maimons have interesting nicknames. That's, that's their culture and community. I would then be running back and forth collecting medicines and delivering them all over the village. On the way, men would catch me in the street and throw my round body, he was round, up in the air. Women would hold me tightly in their arms, not allow me to escape their grip. He was a playful child, playful, philanthropic, uh, humanitarian, serving child. I would roam the streets looking for handicapped and destitute persons. When I found someone, I would run back home for supplies. Taking shortcuts, I charged at full speed without any break, touching full of carts and food stalls, shouting out to people in my way, move away, move away, this is an emergency. The first few times they hurriedly moved aside, but when they subsequently understood the urgency, they would playfully catch me in a clutch and hold me back until I was able to wriggle out and run away again. My mother's kind heart always made me forget that I was missing school. She was content with the use of my thrift to provide comfort to the poor. Now here you see how strong the bond between the mother and child was and how deep an influence of the Sitar Edi's mother was on him. And how beautiful an influence, how lovely, how angelic an influence she was on him. I would, I would spare you for the superlatives. Uh, the priority she gave to social work was to be the foundation of my future. Apart from the work she kept me involved with, I liked playing with my little friends. We made up our own circus, charging children one or two pesos each for our performance. The poor came free and there were never any girls. I was always conscious of giving them their money's worth and towards achieving that purpose. We walked shakily on robes, tied across parallel trees, did somersaults, fought wrestling matches and enacted comic scenes picked up from the madrasa, the mosques or the bazaar. I also love playing Gully Danda in the lane and dirt fields around Batwa. Gully Danda, now again, I'm speaking, not the book, was, is, is, was, was the Indian or Pakistani equivalent of cricket. Nothing, however, equaled my passion for racing before anybody realized I would be far ahead of the others and turn to stand proudly at the finishing line. I ran with such speed that my friends lost interest in the sport, saying, the race ends before it even begins. Every time I suggested racing, they vetoed me and we compromised on the game. I hated failure 
and knew that success was synonymous with effort, by which rule I believed I could win. Again, this is something that perhaps also signifies the, found, uh, the foundation of the success of, uh, of E.V. as a foundation. Sometimes we would sneak into the gardens of rich men and pick corn and fruit. When we were caught, the owners threatened us, next time you would come here, you will be hung upside down in the well. But this punishment was never implemented, and so we continued having fun. My willpower was very strong during times of trouble, and I would not change my course easily. It was, in fact, this attitude that established me as a leader of our group. Leader of our group. So he has been a leader all along. If you remember, in the first chapter, we spoke about him taking leadership position, even at an old age in Goat Gear, the train disaster. He is a firm believer in leadership. I think E.D. is his own brand and style of leadership that perhaps Western management could study. I train and teach on leadership and I'm actually learning from this man. Every time I read about him I go like wow. It's not like voice of women but wow. W -O -W. The only time I, en I entered into a fight was when somebody teased a mentally handicapped person. One morning on my way to the madrasa I noticed an unfamiliar man with unkempt hair, tattered clothes and no shoes. He was surrounded by a group of senior boys from my school. I quickly concealed myself behind the water tank and watched as they poked him with a stick. His expression revealed fear of a poisonous snake. Sensing his paranoia, they furthered the game. One boy came inches closer to his victim's face, to, this, to his victim's face, contorted his own and growled at him like a lion. The poor man leapt back and turned, only to, con to confront another growl. Whenever he turned for safety, he was attacked with the distorted contours and frightening sounds of predators and he ran round in circles with the frenzy of a trapped animal. I was both angry and sad when I walked up to one of the torturers. Tilting my head back to look up at him from my little height, I asked him nicely to stop at once. I repeated what my mother had taught me. This is not the reason you are normal. If you have no good to give him, give him nothing, but do not use God's favours to you against him who has received none. I think this statement of his mother also, now I am speaking, also summarizes Islam. Now, as I speak today, on the 14th of June, I think yesterday there was this, or day before yesterday there was the uh, Florida shooting. And this is the spirit of Islam that I just read out to you. The Muslims, or people who call themselves Muslim, may consider themselves lucky if they think that they're on the right path. And they may also consider those who are not on the right path as unlucky. And this is exactly how this woman summarizes it. If you can't do anything good for them, don't do anything bad for them. Here are these people who are going to gay clubs and shooting. There's another theory that this man himself was a gay and was just a jilted lover and he was trying to kill the other gays. Or maybe he wasn't. He was just a, you know, a fundamentalist Muslim. And his, his Islam brand just taught him to shoot gays or kill gays and feel good about it. Uh, he was an attorney. He was a lawyer. Surprising. Uh, I don't know how he would plead his case if he were alive. Hopefully he's dead. Um, they all turned their attention to me, and my small size became pronounced and similar to their earlier victim's handicap. I fought back with all my strength and came out of the brawl badly beaten. At home, my mother washed my wounds and treated my bruises with more care and affliction and affection than other times. She praised me. You gave a, good, you gave a voice to one who does not have one. You lent him what God gave you. She seemed to know them well. These people are as innocent as babies. Apparently she talked about the mentally handicapped. They know nothing of the world where they have to live as adults. Theirs is the worst plight. So I grew up feeling deeply for those whose mental condition obliterated their very existence. That perhaps also explains how he treated the apparent killer of his beloved grandson Bilal that I spoke of in the first chapter. He was somehow mentally sick and instead of pressing charges against her, he actually had her put in a psychiatric ward somewhere. This is interesting. My father shaved off my hair every time he returned home and the community awarded me the nickname Roti. So Roti is this round, clean thing, bread that people eat. It's the local, it's the Indian and Pakistani equivalent of pizza. It was in keeping with the color of wheat and the round shape of the bread eaten by the people of the subcontinent. My father was against any form of tobacco intake and often warned me against addiction to tea and betel nut. 
On one of his trips, he became worried about my lack of interest in academics as well as my absence from home and contemplated admitting me in a boarding school at Rajkot. I was relieved when he abandoned the idea in consideration for my mother who had cried cons consistently until he changed his mind. Most of my team were namazis. As soon as we heard the call for prayer, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, we dropped anything we were occupied with to hastily perform our ablutions. Then from wherever we were, we would charge to the mosque, where we congregated to tease each other and play pranks until the next call. So that's how deeply religious Sutari he was. He took things playfully. And I think there's nothing wrong with taking your faith playfully as long as you're doing good things. And he was doing good things. At the mosque, we read the Quran in Arabic without translation. That's now I'm speaking. That's another of our misfortunes in Muslim. Most of them read the Quran without even understanding what it means. And those who understand, I don't know what they understand, but they still do terrorism. My father would say about the Molanas, this is very interesting. They want to maintain a tight grip on authority, bind the people to their superior knowledge, keep them ill-informed or misinformed, so that they never gain independence in their faith. They frighten and confuse them, commit them to Islam, but shackle them to themselves. That probably pretty much summarizes what happens by the ulama and mullahs to most of the Muslim world. By the time I was 11 years old, I was regular in both my prayers and my fasts. This also leads me to a thought that Islam needs a renaissance that people like Tehmina Durani, the writer of this book, has uh, also written on, something called Anna Hajra. More about that someday. I'll read that out to you as well. At the mosque, we read the Quran in Arabic. Oh, right, we, I've already read that. Uh, my early childhood was peaceful and without trauma. Nothing untoward or dramatic had occurred until my 11th year when the school bell chimed. I was, trying, I was tying my books together and felt a discomfort that made me look up. It worsened when I noticed the schoolmaster staring with sweet, with sweat beads sliding down his forehead. I looked away nervously, feeling concentration on my work, unable to understand the alien expression that distorted his face from somewhere within. I felt his fiery red eyes lingering, lingering upon me. At last, I scrambled off and ran all the way home. The episode was too late, too late to my mother. And the next morning, I left for the mother's house, worried and confused, but nothing occurred that day nor the next. When the strange look on the schoolmaster's face did not reappear, I became a comfortable king. A few, few weeks later, I think here he's talking about uh, sexual harassment. Uh, that's what I think my opinion is. A few weeks later, huddled together in the classroom, we read aloud from a Gujarati lesson. The different tones and volumes of voices rose high to make one loud noise above the din and through the stifling heat I heard my name, Abdul Sattar. And for some reason, the sound froze me. I hesitated, looked up, and the master gestured for me to come towards him. I was frightened to do so, but he was a schoolmaster. How does one confront authority, challenge the superiority of a teacher, or break free from the intimidation of a student? I followed him out of, out of the class, wondering. When he looked back and smiled, I recognized the expression of the other day, and my heart began to pound. I sensed evil evil. Despite it, I followed for a few steps, then bolted in the opposite directions. I ran, tripping, falling, then charging without stopping until finally, puffing and panting, gasping for breath, I reached home and flopped down on the doorstep. I pulled off my shirt and wiped the sweat from my face. When I had caught my breath and composed myself, I knocked on the door to face my mother. The children are so vulnerable to man, confused me that it must be common did not occur to me then, that I became cautious and suspicious of human exploitation for all times to come. <laughs> Although I related the incident to no one, I left the mother's son in, cl in class four. That's what happened to these young kids who go to mother's house. Many of them are molested and sexually abused by the mullahs and the teachers over there. And then they're turned into Taliban. And then they're brainstormed to hate the West and the infidels, the Hindus, the Christians, and the Kafirs, the Jews, and all these guys. What a sad life they have, and then what a sad death as well. At the age of 11, I took a job in a cloth market at the, at the shop of Haji Abdullah. He paid a salary of five rupees, out of which I hid one rupee in the utensil above the cupboard and gave the rest to my mother. Four of the boys worked in the shop. And as I was happier here than at school, I worked hard. Another thing, people tend to forget that 
when you do things that you like, you actually excel in them. Most people tend to just do the motions. They just do things because they must do them. Um, the saint would sit at one side of the entrance door upon a cushion behind a low table and keep a grim watch over us. We swept the shop and did the dusting, then sat behind the saint in a straight line at the back end, our hands folded on our, on our laps. There was no whispering, no reading newspapers, and no gimmicks. This was a tradition of the shopkeepers, and as much as I had broken rules at school, I observed them at work. Soon I was in charge of collecting the saint's son from school and keeping his accounts for tea. For this, I received tips and saved more money. Early in my life, I recognized my passion for saving and was loath to spend. Maimon ladies observe strict purda. Purda is a wheel covering over the face, uh, shrouding themselves excuse me, from head to foot in shuttlecock burgas that tightly cap their heads and allow them to peep through two meshed holes that fell across their eyes. As only children were permitted in their presence, Child employment in mobile markets became lucrative businesses. Fruit, vegetables, fabric, utensils, and any other wares, and any new wares in the market were sold by this method. The saint would dispatch us with seven to eight lengths of fabric tied into a bundle across each of our bags, and we knocked from door to door. When somebody pushed us in, we were relieved to put down the heavy burden and sat on the floor displaying Japanese poplin, Moroccan georgette, and Chinese silk to enthrall ladies who haggled until finally an agreement was reached. We measured and cut the required meters, counted the money, returned the change, tied up our bears and heaved them up onto upon our bags. Again, then we went off to knock at another door. So he was involved in sales from a very young age. Okay. Uh, uh, the saint made me a mean at these times, a trustee in the presence of God. Once some boys stole money and I promptly reported them, but one of the boys accused me of being an accomplice. The saint was very angry at the ac accusation and, sh and firmly told the boys that he was lying. No son of Haji Shakur's can be a thief, he said, and delegated more duties to me. Now that also shows a, a sort of a discriminatory mindset that's prevalent in the subcontinent and uh, the Middle East where people are respected because of their line whose son they are, whose daughters they are. Well, I don't approve that, but well, I think he must have had his logic to say it. My mother had inherited a small share in a business concern. I would accompany her to collect the profits and she would immediately buy gold. When I read an advertisement for the sales of share for, for, the, for the sale of shares in a Bombay mill, I rushed back home, waited for an opportunity, climbed up and brought down my savings from above my mother's cupboard. I purchased three ten rupee company shares and returned to hide them in the same spot. One afternoon, my friend and I were going to a football match. Passing the main bazaar, we saw a man lying on a platform outside a shuttered shop. Why? Excuse me. My training told me he was not a professional beggar. He was wounded and shivered with a high fever. I told my companion, you go ahead, I'll join you later. I returned home to my mother, who gave me a mattress, a blanket, medicine, clothes and some food. Then I went back, cleaned and bandaged his deep wound. Wondered how he got injured, but did not crow. Next morning, I returned with his breakfast and was astonished to find that he had recovered. I took him to the mosque. He was a strange man amongst us, always staring up as if into the sky. My friend related the incident to others, adding mystery to the story. He'd said something to Roti that he will not tell me. Roti is Hili. Uh, because he was bored. Because his father made him bored every time he'd come back. When the boys inquired, I denied the report outright. He taught me how to read the Quran and explained to me the meaning of charity. He made me aware of the presence of God in humanitarianism. Unlike the people of Mantua, he was broad-minded and, and condemned the high expenses on marriage. Jahiz, or dowry, is a self-imposed burden. It is a sign of arrogance and ostentation. No religion recommends it. In Islam, the concept of Jahiz is symbolic that what she brings is what she represents. The Prophet, peace be upon him, symbolized work and prayer in his daughter's story, dowry. He went on to say, Muslims are short-sighted. When they adopt customs like the dowry system, it will become the future destruction of their society. He never talked with anyone except me. His goodness was evident on his serene face. 
I would take him bread, which he kept for many days. He would eat it at dawn and sunset with water, always forbidding me from bringing more, always fasting. So magnetic was his presence that I forgot my friends and spent most of my time at the mosque. I also forgot my mother. On the 21st day, I arrived as usual at dawn, but he was nowhere to be seen. I searched the other rooms, looked outside and all around, and knocked on all the neighbors' doors to inquire about him, but nobody had a clue. I sat at the entrance of the mosque all afternoon, stopping every man who came to pray and every passerby. Maybe you saw him somewhere else. Did you perhaps see him leave? Nobody knew. I went round the well, behind the water tank and in and out of the bazaar. I searched all the fields and gardens in Bantwa, right up to the main road where I stood in the center and looked as far as it was visible. I talked to transporters, travelers and traders, but no one knew of him. When the sun set, I returned home. He was a traveling soul on a journey. I knew I would never see him again. His disappearance made me melancholic for months. I lost my first teacher. So here it's again symbolic. He did not consider anybody at the madrasa uh, worthy of being called a teacher, whereas he called this man who taught him humanitarianism a teacher. It, one should note that Edi sports a beard. He has a long beard. Many people think that he's perhaps a fundamentalist. Many people call him Molana as well, perhaps as a sign of respect. And perhaps that's why the Nobel community is not considering him for a prize, whereas he does deserve a prize. My sister Zubaydah's marriage was arranged to our maternal aunt's son when they were both in their early teens. So in those days, people were girls were married as teenagers. So 15, 16 year old girls were married. Uh, because my parents had an aversion to show of wealth, my mother had said to a Maimon lady who commented on my sister's meager dowry, this does not mean we love her less, only that we love simplicity equally. Both our loves have unity in her dowry. In her dowry. Beautiful. That's what I said. Uh, a simple ceremony was conducted at the mosque, then registered in the community record. Around 15 family members were, complete, were accommodated in front of her house under a tent, and the bride left with a new family for Bangalore, where her husband worked in a shop. As he quietly accepted things that had to be, nobody but my mother was sad at her leaving. I left the job when it failed to keep my interest and returned to school in the first English class. The schoolmaster had been replaced. I was still not interested in, study, interested in studies but was promoted with first position into second class, passing which at the age of 13 I finally ended my formal education. Looking for some new excitement, we made a program to see a cinema. It was my first film and was called Pukar. I bathed carefully and wore my new red shirt over white pajamas. White pajamas oil my bald head and with great anticipation accompanied my friends to Ahmedabad by bus. As none of us had been outside Banfa before, we gazed wide-eyed at the unfamiliar surroundings and became subdued and intimidated. Understandable. Each of us purchased a ticket and our gang entered the dark hall where our eyes became fixed to the big screen. Without shifting our focus, we settled into our seat, seats and stared while every few minutes rotating ceiling fans blew the smell of perspiration across the hall and into our nostrils. We were sucked out of the world. Soon I was fidgeting in the dark, fighting for an exit from the screen. I could neither concentrate on the story nor on the actors. My friends, I noticed, remained lost. At last it was over. Outside daylight, daylight and, real li and real life dazzled us for a while, and we remained silent as if unhinged. When the excitement subsided, unhinged, a word that sounds very familiar to me, unhinged. When the excitement subsided, my friends, could not speak enough about the event. I tried to remember the film, make my own comments, relate an incident that was totally blank. In Bantwa, all my friends began to behave like the hero. A greased curl of hair appeared on their forehead, greased curl of hair, and they buried their hands deep inside their pockets to stand in the street with their feet wide apart, repeating dialogues they had memorized. Sounds so teenagish. Still the same, I guess. Um, on the other hand, the whole story jumbled up and disintegrated into incomprehensible pieces that floated uselessly in my mind until I forgot the matter. What will I be was my foremost concern. It kept me from concentrating seriously on anything else. I would escape to the bathroom to be by myself. The bathroom. And daydream of the future in peace. I discovered that time spent here in the bathroom was more private than any other. It was, in fact, the only time for, of solitude. Although I lived very much in the present reality, I had 
often visited a time beyond, where I roamed in similar alleys of the whole world. When I mentioned an idea that struck me at such a time, my friends laughed. What do you suppose they come to you? They come to you there. Uh, uh, why, why do you suppose they come to you there, Roti? They should come in the mosque if they were true. Perhaps Satan is misguiding you. I would become defensive. It's not in my control to choose where and when ideas come. So he used to believe in meditation from a very young age without even knowing what he was doing. Although my plans were small, they seemed too big for my size. I sell pencils and matchboxes on the street and invest the money I earn in company shares. The scheme intrigued and impressed me. I will use half my money for the poor. How and what would I do for them? Were questions whose answers kept changing and growing in my mind. Sounds like me. I will build hospitals, make a factory to train and employ the poor, and build a village for the handicapped. If you ask me, I'll build mechanized farms for the poor. But they literally have to do nothing, just walk in the farms and the robots will grow crops for them and food and everything. Start small, I always remind myself. It was in keeping with the respectful labor that my parents had instilled in me. My father had often said, no labor is an insult. The lowest form is dignified and worthy of respect. Start from the lowest rung. Think big, I reminded myself. My father also used to say, it is important to think without limitations. Confining ideas stunt potential. Maimons believed in being part of a cycle. Local farmers grew rice and wheat. Maimon businessmen brought bulk from wholesale markets and sold it to companies and shops. The men from Bantwa soon began to face a serious problem with community jobs. If for some reason they were dismissed or left a company, new employees would not hire them without a letter of approval. This caused delays, unemployment and resentment, and discontent men moved to new areas of work in Delhi, Calcutta and Kanpur. When they became successful and returned to Bantwa, they held meetings to condemn the big businessmen for establishing a monopoly. They spoke of the way poor girls were exploited and treated contemptuously for taking jobs to support family. Whereas a rich man's daughter was appreciated for dancing in a club and the behavior referred to as etiquette, the poor man's daughter's job was ridiculed whereas a, a rich woman's cabaret was appreciated. It was my first major encounter with social injustice. So far, whatever inequality I had witnessed, witnessed was accepted with relative ease and as a will of God. That's also strange. Many this misogyny, uh, all, all this stuff that, that happens in, in the Muslim world or in the religious world is often attributed to God, all this discrimination. That's me. These men raised issues that pointed towards other reasons, human reasons. Something stirred within me and I began to read the Gujarati newspapers where more articles caught my attention. At the age of 13, the, Mus the Muslim Gujarati Gazette, Bombay Samachar and a magazine called Sundays introduced me to the idea of Marx and Lenin. I became aware of the anger against colonialism and Muhammad Ali Jinnah's mission to establish a Muslim homeland. I discovered Abu Zar Ghaffari, Prophet Muhammad's progressive, peace be upon him, the professive, progressive companion who condemned the changing trends of Muslim rulers towards war booty and rebel against the massing of wealth. I was fascinated by his visionary demand for social reforms. I searched the library for literature, literature on world leaders and read the tragedy of Karbala, the history of Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him companions as well as Lenin's implementation of Marxist philosophy. I detected strong similarities in the rebellion of all reformers. They were addressing the same issues. I sent for my first book on Karl Marx from Ahmedabad and when it arrived I read it excitedly. I was very touched by Gorky's book, Mother. As I could only read Gujarati, my exposure was limited. Even in my own language, I had to read a paragraph three or four times before I could comprehend it, but I needed only a little information. Once I understood the, 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 the reason for reactions, I reflected on the various methods by which the ideal could be achieved. Although the theory was correct, I, reportedly, I repeatedly questioned, what are the pitfalls? The vision is true, self-reliance necessary, national and public spirit essential, inequality and poverty unjust and oppression unacceptable. But where is the grey area? What will they overlook? When will they realize a fault? Or is there no fault? These thoughts took long hours of lying on the bench outside my home gazing at the sky or else locked, locked in the toilet. The toilet, remember, his meditation hall, uh, performing ablutions, bathing, and he says delaying. So without... Uh, right, so I will consider I will 
take a break here and I will continue this chapter. Uh, hello. Yeah, that's the uh, end of the part of the book. And so you get a bar and then by reading it out to you. Right. Uh, okay, so I, I became passionate about revolution and was anxious to learn its lessons. Gandhi's decision to remain in Calcutta until the Hindu Muslim riot ceased impressed me. The Far Farms Khadai Fidmatgar party touched me by its very name. The Foxar party moved me by its mission to solve people's problems by traveling from village to village and door to door. Although some of these parties were not main players, I was not interested in success. I recognized the word or act of truth and that became ingrained in my mind. It occurred to me then that my thinking was developing by examples of the smallest actions. They captured my attention. I avoided delving deeper into any subject and understood that I was only looking that I was looking only for symbolic references. For which I concentrated in basic information about lives, personalities, and thoughts of extraordinary men. I had no interest of in-depth studies and details. The nature of people's lives, the circumstances and adversities accentuated their intentions. That Marx had no medicine or coffin to bury his son revealed important dimensions of his mind's development to me. My understanding of Marx led me to believe that Yazid, the villain of Kabbalah, was a class enemy. I began to dislike the big Sarmayadars which is landlords, and in an attempt to clear contradictions, I searched for more stories about wars and revolutionary personalities. These further stood rebellion in my spirit. The tragedy of Kabbalah was an injustice underplayed by Muslim rulers for nearly 700 years. My father said the children of the Shia sect are made to pursue knowledge from the early age of six or seven. They are encouraged not to remain silent at the misdeeds of the executive and fear nothing except God, so that they can stand up at all costs against injustice. Yon, he also told me, although we do not deny the tragedy of Kabbalah, some groups avoid reality and do not want to recall it. Many, much of the present Muslim trends of laziness, passivity against injustice, lack of passion, <clears throat> and honor are due to this escapism. His words became implanted in a fertile mind. Although the Maimans were from the Sunni sect and I knew no followers of the Shia sect, I staunchly upheld the memory of the martyrs of the tenth day of, on the 10th day of Muharram. I would sit in the mosque listening to Imams reading the heart wrenching story and cry bitterly. Uh, and cry bitterly. Surprisingly, at other similar occasions, I would fall asleep, or else, just as happened at the cinema, which is still called nothing. And my, as my interest in information was high, I wondered why this was so, and I concluded that I had my grandfather's tendency to project superfluous, superfluous and surplus matter. My father was a liberal progressive and had a philosophical mind. He was not passionate about this, nor did he pay any attention to rituals. Although he had performed Hajj, he preferred to concentrate on purity of thought and an exemplary growth in love. Yawn, between Asr and Maghrib, prayers around 50 men would collect in a clearing to listen to the tales of those who had returned from travel. They discussed political problems with subconscious stories of the world and new business propositions. When they talked of religion, my father would want to change the subject. Why do you confuse people with what you cannot understand yourself? On our way back home, he would tell me not to listen to many words. To too many words. The strength of words lies in the and otherwise they're meaningless. He, him, he himself was a man of very few words, but whatever he said was enough to make an impact on me. He explained why. Too many dialogues scatter and base. Say a little so that your words are remembered. My mother was also not religious in the ritualistic sense. She had received no formal education and did not know how to say the namaz. Enacting the entire exercise simply by reciting Bismillah Rahman and Rahim. At other times, she would recite Allahu in her prayer beads. Then affectionately blow her breath on me, whispering in my ear, Do you know that I always pray the most for you? She would tell me not to doubt God's understanding of his people. Empty words and long phrases do not impress him. Show him your faith by deeds. Otherwise, why would he believe you? To my parents, a clean and peaceful environment was the basis of his staff. Neither of them are interested in this detail. Although, now this is again very symbolic, this, this shows the kind of Islam that Abu Sazari we believe in, and which I think is the real essence of Islam in any way that it is that Although we were not poor, people thought that we were 
uh, my mother asked her sisters to send their children's old clothes for us, saying, as they go out of them, they need them only temporarily. Oh. Get to the lawn, yawn. With years of labor and effort, many people had become progress, uh, prosperous and living standards had by and large improved. But big houses and expensive furniture failed to influence or attract my parents towards adopting the tent. In fact, we were neither aware of discomfort nor dishonor in simple living and had very few possessions. My father insisted, simplicity is the only beneficial way of life, as it was by choice, there was no conflict. Mayman women were meticulous and especially particular about clean floors. My mother would sweep and polish ours daily, so that it was always shiny. But what we lived on the floor, but then we lived on the floor, slept, sat and ate on it. My own interest in clothes was relatively more than theirs. I loved wearing a coloured shirt over my straight pyjamas. And my mother would stitch me a green or blue one, blue or red one. Knowing them by my favourite colour, I cared for them possessively. As my friends prefer... <laughs> Beyond the fashionable haircuts that had become popular through colonial influence, they wondered why I shaved my head. My father, while lasering it, had told me, this is the most effective way to curb vanity and conceit. It compels you to concentrate on substance. You could probably have known that today, uh, being bald is actually in vogue. Appearance is a distraction. Sur surrendering, surrendering it develops humility and truth in abundance. My, my friend would laugh at me for, for this as well as for my big plans. They, they began to call me Shake Chili, a legendary character with big dreams and no action. They joked. I think when all the matter in your head dries up, it will shrivel like stained bread. Think a little about it again. It's better for your future. I was never discouraged and smiled back at them. I can begin small, but why should I think small? Beautiful. I should. I can begin to swim. think small. I can begin small, but why should I think small? Beautiful. Untoward incidents were rare in Bantra. When a big maimed person was attacked by professional decoys, he defended his family with the butcher's knife until they all until they eventually fled. The story impressed me. I respected his willpower against heavy odds. Oh. The background of the decoys also fascinated me. They were allegedly followers of the, of the reverse of Sufi saint, Pir Dastagi, and spent a portion from their loot towards the peace of the poor. In the name of God and, and their saint, my father pointed out the flaw and this form of worship. Watch the way men delude themselves about God. To feel at peace with their sins, they make him a shareholder in their mistakes, which is so true. If you look at Pakistan's politicians, they lose, they do everything, and then they say, Allah, who Akbar, Subhanallah, we did this, we did that. They have no shame. Whereas up to Sutari, the languages in a public hospital in, in Karachi, they get themselves treated in England or US or anywhere, the Nawaz Sharif and the Zadaris and all these uh, looters and plunderers and corrupt politicians. And yet they take the name of Lord, Allah this and Allah that. I mean, they have no shame and I don't think they deserve to. But anyway, to each his own. Feel at peace with their sins and make him a shareholder, make him a shareholder in their misdeeds. Increasingly, I realize the lack of religious understanding and misinterpretation of Allah's message. At the age of 14, I felt an unusual tug in my heart for a girl. I was too shy to think of it as love, but knew that my feelings were not brotherly. She lived in the, in, in the room of her bars, and at dawn, she would lie down with the picture clutched upon her small waist. While I would be performing ablutions and morning prayers, she would fill water from the tap. Once when she caught my eye fall on her, she looked up and smiled. Blushing, I shied away to hide behind a bush from where I watched her turn around and walk away, her long braids swinging sideways down her back. Sometimes I took the chance to wait in case she made an extra trip, but that never happened and I had to make do with the early morning cyclings. This activity abruptly ended when I heard she was engaged to be married. It was normal for boys to marry early. I was, however, in no position to propose. The heartbreak was short lived. Lying on a ledge, looking at the sky, wondering at the world and why I was in it, I would think, why should I, why have I been sent here? To do what? My mother would come to the doorway and scold me for being awake so late. What do you think about all night? I had nothing to tell her. <laughs> this yawn, disjointed matches, shuffled and reshuffled in my head. 
Like my father, she was also progressive and liberal. She believed in encouraging children towards achieving their natural potential. As I never indulged in behavior offensive to her principles and beliefs, she did not worry about my direction. Her trust in my intentions was based on the powerful influence she continued to hold over my interests and her only concern was my lack of speech. Sometimes my friend had discussions that could never conclude, but broke with daylight. They talked of revolution in Islamic history, and although I identified with these topics, I was neither drawn into participating in the debate nor did I contribute all this and much. Again, a protective blanket seemed to keep surplus matter at bay. Yawn, yawn, yawn. Other than read about revolutionary personalities, I was fascinated by travelogues and scanned Gujarati papers for tourist information and observations of foreign lands. Much exasperation was expressed when I spoke of my desire to travel the world on foot and see the way other people lived. I continued wanting to make money for hospitals and industries. When my friends walked, mocked my daydream, saying, Can't you exchange your plans? Are you not tired of them? Have you not learned something new, something bigger? I would reply irritably. Why should I forsake the previous ones when they have not been achieved? Bantwa was often flooded by heavy rains. Although the town stood on high ground and evaded damage by virtue of that blessing, the dwellers of mud had constructed in low ravines and embankments suffered heavy losses and faced severe hardship. I always felt their suffering deeply. When an entire Paris party died in a bus accident, I had my first experience with corpses and subsequently their funerals. I sat at the side of the accident for a long time, looking at the smashed up bus, feeling a deep regret at the futile loss of life. After this incident, whenever I saw a funeral procession, I would be overcome with sadness. How did he die? How did he die? What will happen to him in the grave? The questions that would come and go in rushes with no adequate answers. The British were pulling out and subcontinent was being divided. A Muslim homeland was being created. Mohammed and Zinai addressed a large valley in Bantra, at which he raised loud and passionate slogans in his favor. Collected a, a party fund of 35,000 rupees, and most of us became four Anna members of the Muslim League. Uh, Jinnah said in his speech that our assistance stay was a benefit for India and disastrous for Pakistan, which would lose the Maiman commercial expertise. Yusuf Arun Nakashi Maiman had also addressed large rallies in large in different towns of Katiawar to convince the Maimans to opt for Pakistan. Much as we agreed with Jinnah's wish, had it not been for the fear of Hindu vendetta, the 25 to 30,000 Maimans of Bantra might not have considered migration. Soon after, Bhatra was attacked by Hindu with the initiation of a Hindu politician called Vallabhai Patel. By scaring us out of India, he aimed at ending the, tr the trading monopoly of our prosperous business community. A few of the violent principles followed and the strategy had its desired effects in disturbing the peace-loving Maimans. After witnessing the first Hindu Muslim disturbances, my father initiated the migration process. He keeps repeating, we must move to Pakistan. In India, we shall not be free men after its formation. He would tell whoever he met thereafter. He will have an op opportunity to live peaceful life and will be ruled by the justice of Islamic laws. Oh my God, that makes me laugh. People easily became convinced of a better future. Despite the general aversion to British rule and the fact that they had created institutions for their personal benefits, my father believed they gave the subconscious an effective and, and efficient administrative system. Although they exploited our economy to its maximum, used our own Christianity, ethnicity, and, in the, and, and religious rigidity to control our destiny. I never blamed them either. In fact, I could not concede to blaming them over ourselves. I argued with my friends, Muslim rulers never look towards grassroots reforms. Mostly, they concentrated in building grand tombs and, mez and mezzanines for dead kings so that their descendants would build theirs. They built large mosque mosques and paid exorbitant sums of money to historians to write their eulogies. What, which became useless and distorted versions of history, with no benefit to the nation or its people. They would not agree, and I would say, God bestows crowns on the heads of men so they can use their maximum ability for their nations and return the favor. Did they pay any price for theirs? I conceded, apart from, from Shesha Suri, who built the Grand Trunk Road and spoke of social welfare. Others did nothing substantial towards uplift. To me, imperialism existed from the advent of man. I would ask my friends, were they not all imperialists? As we perceive Islam as a humanitarian religion, my, my parents and I were extremely disturbed by the stories we heard of the time of Although they were mostly confined to the Punjab, as in Lahore and Rajasthan borders, or at Amritsar, and not many incidents of violence reported in the and massacres and killing the people who had long lived together upset us deeply. On the sixth day of September, 
in the year 1947. We waited for the train to take us to the camp at Ocha Port. My sister's husband was delayed in Bangalore and so she came with us. The Indian government, having realized the impending loss of our business acumen, delegated the assistant, com as the assistant commissioner to persuade us to stay. And at the railway station, he tried to dissuade us from leaving India. But my father was adamant and advised everybody to remain committed to Pakistan. 4,000 members embarked on the train to Ocha, where we camped for five days, eating only lentils and bread, before boarding the, the boat to Karachi. It took two days at sea, and we suffered no inconvenience. When the boat anchored at Karachi's port, a heavy smell of fish hit us. My mother clutched Aziz by the arm while I gripped my sister's hand lightly, fearful of the uncertainty but anticipating excitement. The only loss I felt was for my wasted company shares lying uselessly in the utensils we had abandoned on the shelves in bar. With this, I conclude chapter two, and I shall be with you later. There you are. This is where I am. It's called the Al Muntaza Club in Dubai. Right, so we will catch up later for chapter number three.